me just say, I can finally sit down and play the piano for more than 30 minutes at a time, and that has not happened since November. <laughs> so, yay! So now you're going to have to listen to me play a little bit more. <laughs> I apologize. I went through, I think I worked up six songs this week trying to figure out which one to do, and this is the lucky winner. So I hope you all like it. It's Everything by Lauren Daigle. <laughs> Sorry. Even the sparrow has a place to lay its head. So why would I let worry steal my breath? Even the roses you have clothed in brilliant red. Still I'm the one you love more than this You give me everything You give me everything You give me everything I need Push and pull at your command So you can still my heart with your hand You tell the seasons When it's time for them to turn So I will trust you even when it hurts you give me everything, you give me everything, you give me everything I need. You give me everything, you give me everything, you give me everything. I can't see you lead me when I can't hear you show me when I can't stand you carry me when I'm lost you will find me when I'm weak you are mighty you are everything I Happy are the feet. 
that brings the good news news of salvation. salvation. Isaiah Isaiah 52.7. Okay, one last announcement before we get into the uh, Word of God. Melissa just said if, if you brought money for the, uh, the youth t-shirt, t-shirts that were ordered, um, she'll be uh, receiving that money um, after the service. And uh, if you could, just have the payment here by April 3rd. Um, that's for the, the t-shirts that they're going to be wearing uh, for the school carnival. Um, so again, if you have the money for the youth t-shirts, see Melissa uh, AAA after the service. And with that, we'll, uh, we'll open up this morning. What a blessing to just be reminded that God has provided us armor to fight with in this, in this crazy world that we live in. Um, and we're going to begin a brand new study this morning in the book of John, John's Gospel, John chapter 1, with a message entitled, The Life and the Light. John chapter 1. If you stand with me as we honor the Word of God, beginning in John's Gospel this morning, John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Skip down with me to verse 14, please. Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we once again, Lord, are reminded of the words of Jesus, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We pray, Lord, that we'd find strength, that we'd find nourishment, that we'd find hope, in your word to us today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Today we're going to begin a journey through the Gospel of John. And among the four Gospels, the Gospel of John is the last to be written approximately 90 to 100 A.D. And it's the most unique of all four Gospel accounts. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are described as what many call the synoptic gospels. And when they say synoptic gospel, it simply means that they are seen together with a common view. And when you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that's what you'll find. You'll find many of the same accounts, many, even some of the same language even. They are seen with a common view. But when you come to John, John sees things in slightly a different angle. And when I say When we look at the Gospels, people say, why is there four Gospels? You know, what's the point of having four Gospels talking about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ? And the best way I can describe it is this. It would be like each of us witnessing a crime scene. You know, even if we sectioned off the church here, you know, this side, the middle, and then this side, all saw one crime. They would describe it from a different angle. They have slightly a different angle over here than those in the center. And these over here have slightly a different angle than these ones over here. They all saw the same thing, but they're communicating it to us 
from their angle. And John has the most unique angle of them all. And it's strikingly different. Why? Because you'll find some things that are missing from John's gospel. You don't see the birth account. You don't see Bethlehem. You don't see any demonic encounters. There's no Last Supper meal. There's no Garden of Gethsemane. And there's no ascension. John focuses on Jesus' ministry in Jerusalem, where the rest of the Gospels focus mainly on Jesus' ministry in the area of Galilee. And if you were with us on Sunday night, we just studied through the Gospel of Mark. And one commentator described the difference between Mark and John like this. He said, quote, Mark saw things plainly, bluntly, and literally. John saw them subtly, profoundly, and spiritually. We may say that John lit Mark's pages by the lantern of a lifetime of meditation. And that is exactly what you're going to see. And when you come to each gospel, you have to understand that each gospel was written to a different audience primarily. For example, Matthew was written primarily to a Jewish audience. Mark was written to a Roman audience. Luke, predominantly to a Greek audience. And John was written to a basically universal audience. And the last thing I want to say about the differences between the gospel, the best way I've heard this described was by the, na by the man of, named William Barclay. And he said, oftentimes, what you'll see on a stained glass window is a picture, a biblical picture of four things. You'll see the ox, you see the man, you see the lion, and you see the eagle, all portrayed on a beautiful piece of stained glass. And he said each of those uh, pictures describe one of the Gospels. And he said the man represents Mark. Mark is very plain, he's very straightforward, the most human of the Gospels. The lion represents Matthew. He represents Jesus as the Lion of Judah. The ox represents Luke, the animal of service and sacrifice. But here's what he said about John. He said, John is like the eagle. For just like the eagle, which alone, out of all the creatures, can gaze directly into the sun and not be dazzled, John has the most penetrating gaze as he looks into the mysteries and eternal truths of the very mind of God. John is very deep. John is very spiritual. John shows the light of Jesus Christ in its fullness. Someone said this, It has been rightfully said that the accounts in John's gospel are some of the most precious possessions that the church has. John just doesn't give us the account of what happens. He gives us the meaning behind the account. For example, the feeding of the 5,000. We have that account, all four Gospels, but only John tells us Jesus' discourse after that, where Jesus, if you recall, will say, I am the bread of life. John tells us the meaning behind the account. That's the difference between the Gospels. What is the purpose of the Gospel of John? John clearly gives his purpose in John chapter 20, verse 31. John 20, verse 31, the purpose of this gospel, he says is this, These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. What's the purpose, John? Why are you writing this gospel? that people may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. And friends, that is why we went through the book of Romans, and that is why now we are going through the book of John. Romans and John are literally the foundations of the church, and that will build us up into deeper books like the book of Hebrews and the book of Revelation, but these are the foundational books of the church. And it's my prayer as we go through this book together, that if you do not know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that as we read this, that you may believe in Him and have life in His name. That's the purpose of this. Who's the author? The author is John the Apostle. John wrote the Gospel of John, 
1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the letters towards the end of your Bible. And he also wrote the book of Revelation as he was exiled on the island of Patmos. Okay? Who was John? Who was John? John was a fisherman. He was a fisherman. He, he had a brother named James. So you had James and you had John. Their father was the man by the name of Zebedee. And John and James, they had a nickname. Their name was the Sons of Thunder. The Sons of Thunder, right? It sounds like a tag team wrestling match. Here comes the Sons of Thunder, right? And at one point, even in the ministry, they asked Jesus, hey, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy these folks? And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. He's like, he's like pull it back, Sons of Thunder. But I, I say this because at the end of John's life, the Son of Thunder eventually becomes a very mellow, a very loving, a very tender-hearted man. Because at the cross, remember, when Jesus is hanging upon the cross, he makes seven statements from the cross. And one of the statements is to the Apostle John, who's standing at the foot of the cross, and his mother Mary is standing at the foot of the cross as well. And he says to John, Behold your mother, and to Mary, behold your son saying, you know what, John, you are in charge of taking care of my mother now. That was the tender heart of this son of thunder towards the end. A man by the name of Josephus, he's a Jewish historian, said this about John. His last dying words were these. Brothers, learn how to love one another. Those were the last dying words of John. Brothers, learn how to love one one another. And so today we begin the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, and we're going to look at seven truths about Jesus Christ portrayed in these verses. And the first thing that we're going to look at this morning is the eternity of Christ. The eternity of Christ. Look at verse 1, John 1 1. In the beginning was the Word. He, in this prologue of the Gospel, he speaks, first of all, in the very first three words of the gospel, he says that Jesus is eternal. He says, in the beginning. In the beginning. That is to say, before Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John says, I'm going to take you back before that. Jesus was in the beginning, even before that. He is eternal. There was never a time that Jesus did not exist. Friends, Jesus is eternal. And he says, he uses a title. He says, the Word. The Word. I want to look at this title of Jesus just for a moment because I think it's important. This term, the Word, okay, both to the Jewish mind and the Greek mind, it was very important. This word is the logos, okay, and it, what this word means is this. It is the creating principle of the world. It was the designer behind the design, the thinker behind the thought. The creating principle of the world. And John speaking to the universal audience, to the pantheist and to the Gnostic. Now remember what the Gnostics believed. The Gnostics said the spirit is good, but all the matter is evil, okay? And to that, to that audience, he says, look, Jesus, the Logos, okay, who was eternal, he is the designer behind the design. John said, look, right off the bat, first sentence, John says, let me tell you who the power behind creation is. It's the Word, the Word. Jesus, to both the Greek and to the Jewish mind, he was communicating this, that Jesus was God. And Jesus would even say this about himself. He would say, I am the Alpha, I am the Omega, I am the first and the last. And we read what, Psalm 90? It says, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Jesus is eternal. Listen, friends, there was or never will be a time that Jesus did not exist from eternity past to eternity future. Jesus is eternal. And Jesus would say in John chapter 8 about himself, he would say, Before Abraham was, I am. 
I am. That takes you back to Exodus chapter 3, right? The burning bush. Moses is there at the burning bush and he says, who should I tell him sent me? And he says, I am who I am. The self-existing one. He doesn't need to be created. He's the self-existing one. He's the uncreated cause. He is the logos. He is the word of God. First of all, John speaks to the eternity of Jesus. The second thing John speaks of is the personality of Jesus. Again, these are just deep, deep, deep truths that you will never, ever be able to plumb the depths of these. These first verses of the Gospel of John are just intense and just saturated with just truth about Jesus. The personality of Jesus, he says there in verse 1, he was with God. It speaks to the personality. It speaks to the Trinity. It speaks to the fellowship of the Godhead. Remember what the Trinity is, right? Three distinct persons in one essence. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. And you say, Pastor, can you explain the Trinity to me? No, I cannot explain the Trinity to you. It is a mystery, and there's all type of illustrations that you can use, like the ice and the water and, you know, the clover leaf, and you can use the egg, and all these illustrations at some point fall apart. But I want to make this clear to you. Jesus is not a separate being, as the Mormons teach. He is a separate person. Three persons in one. And when John says he was with God, it means that he had the closest, most intimate, face-to-face -face relationship with God the Father. It was the personality of Jesus. We see the eternity of Jesus, first verse. We see the personality of Jesus. And then thirdly, we see the deity of Jesus. Look, it says, and the word was God. It's very plain and simple. And the word was God. Friends, it says right there in that first line that Jesus is God. Now, if you take the Jehovah Witness Bible and you would open it up to the New World Translation, you would see that they changed two little things. And you would open up to that verse and you would read this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was small letter A, and then small letter G, God, was a God. That changes everything, doesn't it? That means that Jesus is just one of many gods. But John says, no, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And friends, I don't like to belabor these type of texts, but I think this is important to, to labor on this a little bit this morning. If you go back and you must follow it and do some studying into the original language of this, what do you find? The original Greek language renders this verse like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God was the Word. That is the original language of the text, friends. And you say, why are you, why, why are you talking about this? Why are you talking about Greek languages? Because, friends, the Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons, the Christian science people will all deny the G deity of Jesus Christ. And you say, why does this even matter to me? Because, listen, friends, a Jesus that is not God is a Jesus that cannot save. And that is why this is important, friends. A Jesus, if someone comes to you preaching a Jesus that is not God, it's a false Jesus. Friends, they're often, they are on their way to hell. And again, people come to me all the time. Jesus never claimed to be God. Oh, he never claimed that. Read the Gospels. He claimed it. He said seven I am statements. I am the resurrection and the life. What is that talking about? I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Why did they crucify him on a Roman cross? Because they said he blasphemed. Because what? He equated himself with God. There was no confusion to the Jewish leaders of the time what Jesus was saying. And there should be no confusion to us what the Gospel of John is saying. Jesus here and John is saying, I am God. Jesus is God. Jesus is eternal. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. 
Jesus is deity. And fourthly, this morning, Jesus is the creator. Verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. As the word, as God, Jesus is the creator. It says, all things were made through him. Let me take you back again to the very first book of your Bible, Genesis 1.1. It said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John 1.1, Jesus created. Colossians 1.16 said, for by him, that is Jesus, all things were created, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. Friends, when it says that in him all things are whole together, all things consist, it means everything is kept from dissipation, from falling apart. Today... The scientists will tell you it's the gravitational pull that holds everything together. It's the laws of nature that hold everything together. It's mother nature that keeps things going. Friends, let me tell you, behind the gravitational pull, behind the laws of nature, behind mother nature is the logos, the word, the word who created all all things. It says nothing was made that was made that he did not make. Jesus is the creator God. Friends, if he pulled his hands off this for one moment, it would all fall apart. All of it would fall apart. And that brings me great comfort today that if he can hold this world, this universe together, guess what? He can hold my life together. He can hold your life together. Jesus is creator Fifthly, this morning, Jesus is the life giver. Look at verse 4 and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. John goes even deeper now, and he uses one of his favorite words. One of John's favorite words is life, life. It's the word Zoe, and it's used 36 times. And you find it on the lips of Jesus often. Remember, he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the resurrection and the life. He said, I came to give them life and life more abundantly. Peter said, where else can we go? You have the words to eternal life. One of his favorite words, life. And this life is not just physical life. This life here, what he talks about, is a spiritual life. It's an abiding life. It's a life that can only be found in Jesus Christ. Friend, do you want to know the meaning of life today? It's found in the person and relationship with Jesus Christ. That's one thing that brought me to Christ. I think I've told you the testimony. I came down, I looked at all the mess, I looked at my life, looked at all the alcohol and all the other stuff that was going on, and I said, you know what, there has to be more to life than this. And the Lord, thank God, brought me to the point to understand what life is really all about. And it's found not in coming to church, but in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Friends, if you want to know life, it is found in Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, 12, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Do you know, friend, today that you can be living and be a dead man or a dead woman? There are many people out there today, they are alive, but they are literally walking dead folks. They are dead spiritually. That's what the Bible says, that before we come to Christ, that we are dead in the trespasses of our sins. Friends, people try to find life in many different places. They try to find life in substances, They try to find life in relationships. They try to find life in success and money. They try to find life in academia and positions. Friends, real, true life is found in Christ. Psalm 16 is one of my favorite psalms, and it says, listen, friends, it says, you will show me the path of life. 
In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The path of life is found in Jesus. Do you know the religious leaders? They try to find life in their religion, the religion of the day, the things that they did, the things that they didn't do. And Jesus rebuked them and said, you think that you have life in them, in the scriptures, but you don't. And he said, I am the life. Friends, there's people out here that understand who Jesus is. They know about Jesus, but they do not have an intimate, life-changing relationship with him. The question is, have you been born again of the Spirit of God? And say, people say, how do you know if you've been born again of the Spirit of God? Your life will change. Your life will do a 360, friend. There will be changes that happen in your life. Are you simply just existing today? Or do you have a life, a real, true, spiritual life in Jesus Christ? He came to give you life and life more abundantly. He is the life-giving God. Sixthly, this morning, Jesus is the light bearer. He is the light bearer. Not only is he the creator, not only is he the light giver, Jesus is the light bearer. Look there, it says, or the Bible says that God is light and in him there is no darkness. Jesus came as a light in the darkness, yet the darkness could not comprehend it. When it, the Bible says it could not comprehend it, it means literally to extinguish it or to quench it. Oh, but they tried, didn't they? They tried to snuff out the light. They literally tried to crucify him. They beat him. They scourged him. They spit upon him. They wanted to put the light out. And they thought they did. But they, we know the rest of the story. On the third day, the light shined again. They tried to quench it, but they couldn't. And friends, they're still trying to quench the light today. The people would have it, they would have it, no, nothing better than to say, you know what, you can, your, Christian, your Christian religion, your Christian belief system, that's a private thing. That's between you and just your, your God. Don't, don't talk about that in school. Don't talk about that here in the workplace. Don't talk about that here. No. Our faith, friends, is a public thing. We can't let them take and try to cover that light up. Jesus said, let your light shine. This is another of John's favorite words. He likes to use life, and he likes to use light. 21 times he uses it. And what did, Jesus, or what did God do in the very beginning? He said, the first thing that he said, let there be light. That's what he said. And remember what the world was before that? It said it was without form, and it was void. It was almost as if it was a little bit chaotic, right? And then God speaks light and he takes and he orders the chaos. He starts to order the chaos. And then also think about light, friends. Light reveals things. It reveals those things which are hidden. And that's why Jesus will say in John chapter 3 that men loved darkness instead of the light. Friends, aren't you thankful for light today? Not just in the building, but the sunshine, we just sang about sunshine. You know, if we didn't have light, electricity, think about where we'd be. We'd be back here with candles. I mean, we need light to show us the way around, right? You know, without a car without headlights, pretty dangerous situation, right? We need light, and it illuminates the way. Friends, Jesus alone can order your chaotic life. Jesus alone can show us who we are. And most importantly, listen carefully, Jesus alone as the light reveals God to us. And he reveals the path of eternal life. Jesus said himself in John chapter 8, he said, I am the light of the world. If anybody follows me, he will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Let me ask you, friends, are you walking in the light today? Jesus called us as believers in Jesus Christ to reflect that light to the world. Jesus is the eternal God. Jesus is the creator God. Jesus is the life-giving God. Jesus is the light-bearing God. And fifthly, or lastly this morning, Jesus is the incarnate God. The incarnate God. Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, 
and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And here's the climax, friends. This is the climax. Another profound mystery right off the bat here in the Gospel of John. We saw the Trinity, right? Three in one. Now we see Jesus' nature, okay? Two in one. Two natures in one. What is the incarnation of Jesus Christ? The incarnation simply means this, to be clothed in flesh. And then John says, he dwelt among us. That literally means he tabernacled, he pitched his tent among us. Think about the Old Testament tabernacle, that little tent in the wilderness. What was it made of? Rugged animal skins, right? It had this big, like, you know, it was a tent made of animal skin, but inside, what was happening? The glory of God was in it. And the, John is saying, listen, friends, Jesus, the glory of God, came and clothed himself in humanity. And right at this point, in the beginning of the gospel, this would have blown the Gnostic people away who said nothing uh, physical could come of God necessarily. And John is saying, look, Jesus was not a phantom. Jesus was not a spirit. He was human in the flesh, the incarnate God. And people will ask often, what happened at the incarnation? What happened at the incarnation? Did Jesus lose some of his deity? Did something get subtracted from Jesus? Was it subtraction? No. Jesus lost nothing at the incarnation. What happened then? Was it division? Was it like our coffee creamer? Was it half and half? Was Jesus half man and half God, like this split personality? No. It wasn't subtraction either. This is what it was. It was addition. At that point, at the incarnation, Jesus added humanity to his divinity. Okay? He added humanity to his divinity. He never ceased to be God. He never ceased to be holy. He never ceased to be perfect. But friends, listen carefully. At that point, he laid down some of his divine prerogative. You know, for the theologians out here, Philippians chapter 2, they call it the kenosis passage. And it simply means at this point, Jesus emptied himself. He laid aside some of his divine privilege for a moment. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that he was tempted in every way as we were, with, but, we, but he was without sin. Friends, he never lost his divinity in the incarnation. And I want you to hear this statement because, and if you're a note taker, I would like you to write this down because this literally will summarize volumes and volumes of theology in one statement, okay? About the incarnation. There was a time when Jesus was God and not man, but there was never a time when he was man and not God. There was a time when Jesus was God and not man. But there was never a time when he was man and not God. That is what happened at the incarnation. And you say, Pastor, why, why are you again, are you sort of laboring on this? Because friends, listen carefully. If there is no incarnation, we cannot be saved. If there is no incarnation, we cannot be saved. If there is no incarnation, incarnation, we still need payment for our sin. If there is no incarnation, listen carefully, God is then totally removed from the pain and the suffering of this world. But if there is an incarnation, listen, He knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like to feel pain. It says even Jesus wept in His incarnation. If there is no incarnation, listen we simply are here worshiping a peasant carpenter if there's no incarnation. If there's no incarnation, there's no benefit, there's no permanent significance, but if there is the incarnation, there is great benefit and there's great eternal significance. 
And I love what John says here about Jesus here. He says he's full, oh, you got to love this, great, he's full of grace and truth. He's full of grace and truth. Aren't you glad that it doesn't, he didn't say he's full of con condemnation and wrath? He's full of grace and he's full of truth. The law, he said, came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. What does the law do? What did the law do through Moses? It condemned us. But Jesus, through grace and truth, liberates us. The law condemned us. Grace liberates us. And as we wrap this up this morning, verse 18, we didn't read it off the bat, but if you look at verse 18, John 1, 18, listen, Jesus declares God to us. Verse 18, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. When John says to declare Him, it means to unfold, to explain, to interpret. He says, do you want to know what God is like? Do you want to know what the Word is like? He said, He's the creative power behind creation. He's the thought behind the reason. Even at one point, Philip will say to Jesus, I want you to show us the Father and it will suffice us. And Jesus said to him, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You say, what does God look like? What does God look like? God looks like Jesus. He's full of grace. He's full of truth. He's full of glory. Samuel D. Gordon said this, Jesus is God spelling himself out in language that man can understand. You want to know what God is like? Look at the person of Jesus Christ. Look at the Gospels. See the person of Jesus Christ, and then you will know what God is like. And you know, friends, Jesus never denied any of this. Because even after the resurrection, remember he appeared to Thomas? We always pick on Thomas the doubter, right? Uh, I'm not going to believe unless I see it. I want to see the prince. I want to put my hand in his side. And Jesus comes up to Thomas, and you know the story. He says, go ahead, Thomas. If this is what you need, Thomas, go ahead. And he does. And this is what we miss with Thomas' life. He is the only disciple that says these words. And it's a great verse to share with your Jehovah Witness friends. Thomas says this, My Lord and my God. And he worships Jesus. My Lord and my God. Friends, this is Jesus. This is Friends, is the beginning of the Gospel of John. And you say, Pastor, you just expounded some, some, some truth about Jesus to me. How can I take this into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at my work, in my job, in my community? I just want to leave you with a couple thoughts. Since Jesus is eternal, listen, there is never a time He's not going to be there for you. In your life, or in your death. He's eternal. He will always, always be there in life and in death. Since Jesus is creator, listen, our, per we, our lives have purpose and meaning. They're not, just not, we're just not random blobs of, of uh, molecules running around this earth with no purpose and no meaning. Jesus is creator, and he holds this world together, and he holds each of our lives together. Thirdly, since Jesus dwelt among us, he knows exactly everything that we're going through right now. Whatever is going on in your life right now, he understands it, he knows about it, and he cares about it because he dwelt among us. And because Jesus is the life giver and the light bearer, friends, as we look at the world getting ever so darker, we can still have hope and light in this dark world. And lastly, because Jesus is God, He is worthy of our worship. Friends, this is the Jesus that we love. This is the Jesus that we worship. And this is the Jesus that the Gospel of John proclaims. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for these words. I don't know, Lord, if... On this side of heaven, we'll ever truly understand all of these things. We could meditate upon them the rest of our life, Lord, and only really scratch the surface. 
I pray, Lord, that each of us here within this place would know who Jesus is, not just in our minds, but in our hearts, that we would come to love him, that we come to know him, that we would come to have this personal, intimate relationship with him, that we know him as the eternal God, that we would know him as our creator, that we know him as the one who gives us purpose and the one who gives us hope. Father, help us to worship you, Lord, as you deserve for being the God that you are, the God who came down clothed in humanity to save us from our sin, to know and experience everything that we've experiencing, that we are experiencing right now. We thank you for the hope that we have. And I pray, Lord, that if there is any, Lord, today who do not have this relationship with Jesus, the Word, that today would be the day that they would come to know Him, that they would come to confess their sins, that they would come to lay down, Lord, their lives before Him and say, you know, I want to know the meaning of life. I've been just floundering and searching and everything just comes up empty. I want to, I want to have life. Jesus offers that life today. And I pray, Lord, as we conclude this service, that you would just search the hearts here within this place, that if there is any here who want to know life, who want to know light, that they would be able to give their heart to the Lord today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, as the uh, musicians come up to sing the, uh, the last song, As we talked about the person of Jesus Christ, I told you a little bit about my testimony. I don't know where you're at today. Maybe those thoughts have come to you and said, you know what? I don't. There's got to be more to life than this. There's got to be more than life just to even coming to church on a Sunday morning. There's got to be more than life than, you know, just doing some community projects. There is more to life than that. It's found in a daily, everyday relationship with your Savior. And I'm going to give you that opportunity today to come forward, and this could be the day where you say, you know what? On March 20th, the first day of spring, I found life. I found light in the person of Jesus Christ.